Talk Ag to Me, a podcast dedicated to improving ag literacy around the globe. I'm your host, Brandon Black, and unfortunately, my co-host could not join me today. However, Evan might be joining us later today. We'll have to see about that. But today, we do have a special guest. Today with us, we have Mr. Kevin Kwan. Mr. Kwan, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Kevin Kulwan, as Brendan just told you. I've been in the San Joaquin Valley now for 52 years, been involved with agriculture all 52 of those years, been involved uh, as an ag teacher for 28 years. Uh, before that, was an FFA member at Hanford High School and kind of loved being in Tulare, loved the production side and the stuff we have here in Tulare. Married 26 years and have three children. My oldest daughter is a year away from graduating with a degree in ag marketing from fresno state and so yeah we raise livestock go to jackpot shows all the stuff that us in the rural communities do sounds good all right so um, today's episode is going to be centered around um this being a podcast dedicated to improving ag literacy and and how to effectively communicate with the public about agriculture topics i thought it'd be important for us to talk about um how we engage with the public on uh, on a daily basis in terms of um how we convey our message to them about agriculture and uh, in rare cases where we have to engage in arguments with people that aren't so willing to communicate, um, how we effectively do that without being disrespectful or, or condescending in any way, make sure we still get our point across. And I thought Mr. Coyne could help with that here. Well, I, I look forward to it. I, I think it's a discussion, frankly, that uh, as I've told you, all three of you, how proud I am that you guys are starting this because I think these are the conversations that start and now as social media is such a huge thing with with all people not just kids anymore Absolutely. that i think this is a platform that i mean even if there's only a couple things today that people can take from it or if they think about it or this starts in another chapter someplace i don't see a, a downside to that whatsoever no me either yeah um, i made a point about that in a, a couple episodes ago um the whole point of this podcast is just to really just get the word out there and, and show that this can be a method of communicating agriculture information Absolutely. it's not a matter of who's the most popular who's mo who makes the most money it's just a matter of getting our message out there and any way we can do that i think is the most effective way agreed so uh, just to get into our uh, our interview here i think i'll start with our first question do you believe there's a definite way to win an argument if you if we're talking about an argument I'm not sure anybody wins when it's an argument. Okay. And as I look at it, I think arguments are based on, as I look at it, two things. One is emotion, mm -hmm. which I think can be dangerous. And a lot of times, and we've all been in arguments, uh, they tend to get relatively heated because we're not, first of all, we're getting very emotional about something. And second of all, I think sometimes there's a lack of fact yes. a lot of times with, with arguments. And so I think in an argument, we all lose. And I don't think today in American agriculture with some of the things that we face from radical environmentalists, radical animal rights activists, the, even our own government that is putting a lot of regulations and restrictions, conducting ourselves with an argument I think lowers our intellectual standard mm -hmm. to a point that I think it actually makes us look even worse. I think all, too often there's a stereotype of people in agriculture and that uh, they might be good in the dirt, but how intelligent really are they? Mm. Until you meet some of these people and understand the, the things that they have to do on a daily basis, and you realize very quickly that they are highly intelligent people in all forms. Mm. And I guess what I would say is I'd change the paradigm of that question, and I, maybe it's semantics, Brennan, and this is what you meant. Mm -hmm. How do you win a discussion? Yes, I think that's maybe more and accurate so, way. I think there's, a, there's several things, and one of them... I feel very strongly about this. I think you have to know your position extremely well. And I think you have to remain educated on the topics that potentially you could have a discussion with. Because I think there's enough stuff that comes out on a continual basis that we have to make ourselves aware of. At the same time, I think you have to know the opposing point of view as well. because. If you know your side, but, you're lim you, but you don't understand the other person's side, well, now you don't know the, the fullness of the equation that you're dealing with. Right. I think the third thing is there's some interpersonal types of skills. And I think we have to approach, when we have a debate or we have a discussion, we have to approach that and, and really disengage ourselves from the personal kind of types of things that somebody else might say. Mm. 
because again, that's when you start getting into an argument, right? You start cutting people off, um, voices tend to raise, and now you're not thinking through thought process. So I think it's don't have uh, thin skin, mm. know that somebody's not going to agree with you. There might be an acceptance of the fact that I'm not necessarily going to change this person's point of view. I think there are groups out there that have a belief system that's almost like, a, I would say, a religious belief system. They believe it as if it were their religion. And I'm not sure we are going to convince some of those people. It's the people that are in the middle, the people that don't know. I think that's the ones that we, we really need to target. And we can't do that if we come off condescending, if we come off making them feel like they're inadequate because they don't have the information. And so naturally they're going to believe the opposing point of view if that's how we go about that. And I think it, I don't look at winning a discussion or winning a debate in terms of I got you. Winning is, in my opinion, did I make this person at least think about their position? Make them question their position. It's what I do to you guys in class. Absolutely. I just want you to question. I, I'm not interested in changing your, your mind necessarily, but I do want you to ask the question. Okay. And I think that's, that's a winning strategy. At least that's the winning strategy. And I actually had a, an example of this when uh, Kathy and I and Audra were at St. Jude and we were there our very first time. Mm-hmm. And obviously in a children's hospital, children's cancer hospital, there's lots of very sick children. And the parents want to know, how did this happen? Why did this happen to my child? And so I was sitting in, it was actually uh, the waiting room of, uh, not the oncology clinic, but before she was going to go in for radiation. Mm -hmm. And there was some parents there talking and they got to talking about all the pesticides that are in these kids. And it's, it's it's a wonder that more of them are not sick. And they blame, they're really blaming it on the pesticides. And so I just interjected, I began to listen to what they were saying. And I just began to ask them questions. Mm -hmm. Questions like, do you know the rate at which these things are applied? Do you know how what it takes to get a product from a Monsanto or a Bear Crop Science? What it takes, the years of research, EPA has to sign off on it, FDA have to sign off on it, USDA has to sign off on it, and it's about a 10-year process. You know that. Right, yeah. And so at the end of that, they asked me, how do you know all this stuff? And that's, that's when I said, okay, I'm, I'm an ag teacher been involved in agriculture I didn't say that initially because I didn't want there to be a bias in the conversation right and so at the end of it they wanted to know the answers to those things and it ended on a I don't know that I changed their mind uh, they had enough to deal with with a very sick child with cancer Absolutely. but just to cause them to think a little bit at least they're going to question it when they see things on the on TV or social media that was the purpose Okay. Yeah. Um, you actually answered a, a couple of the other questions I had on, on my oh. list for you. But that's, that's all right. I'm, I'm glad that you brought some of those points up. There's something that I really wanted you to, to go in depth about, and you definitely did. Um, one of the points you brought in towards the end of your answer there was uh, how you didn't talk about how you were an ag teacher before you started engaging in that conversation. I mm-hmm. think that's a really important point that I hadn't really thought about before. But um, in a lot of discussions, especially discussions with people that are very passionate towards one side of, of a, mm-hmm. a topic, um, the second you bring in your association with that topic is often the second that they either lose interest or they gain your side. And it depends on, like, for example, if you have started the conversation with, I'm an ag teacher, listen to what I say, they would have been turned off automatically because, they, like you said, they believe you in bias. And the potential is there, yeah, that they could have. Uh, or, or there is an inherent, inherently, I'm going to support the agriculture industry because that's where I'm being paid. Right. You know, that animal rights activist would look at a dairyman and go, well, of course you think this is okay because you're making money off of it. Right. But as you're saying, by talking about your points initially and then going into the fact that you're an ag teacher after they already asked you that, it already gets to the point where they're already, like you said, thinking about that topic in a general perspective and then you give them your side. At that point, they're not going to change their mind on what you said because you provide your facts effectively and in a way that's already making them think. I think that's very important for for our uh, audience to, to understand. Um, so another one of my, uh, my questions for you is, um, what do you believe is the most important attitude to have? And you may have talked about this a little, a little bit in your answer um, in terms of explaining these concepts to an unaware public. Like what kind, of, what kind of voice did you use when you talked to them? Again, I think first of all, I think you have to be able to, to be willing to ask them mm-hmm. what do they believe and why and to hear what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Not just placate them with the, 
the pretense that you're listening, but to actually hear that so that you now have from their position, what is their position? And is it based on fact? Is it based on emotion? What's it based on? From there is when you get to have the depth in the discussion. And, and we all appreciate when somebody looks you in the eye, actually listens to what you're saying. You feel like you have value. You feel like you're important. Absolutely. There's a couple podcasts that I listen to. And, and Jordan Peterson on YouTube and on his podcast, he does a very effective job. And I've, I've watched him several times, not even so much from the standpoint of the information that I'm getting, but to watch from the standpoint of how is he conducting himself. We learn from a lot of people. Yes. And I think that was something that I learned a great deal from. Now, I don't know that we always have the opportunity, like going back to our last question, for people to not know where you come from. Right. I mean, you, you can get that at times. I don't think that that necessarily is going to be disaffective to being able to have a really sound, logical, in-depth discussion. All right, I agree. You know, so I think the attitude that you come into this thing with is, first of all, we want them to question if, let's say, we'll give an example that it's an environmental group. And not, not a real radical environmental group, but people that are just concerned about nature and the environment, whatever. Right. If you understand their perspective, we also probably have a lot in common. Mm. Because we also want the environment protected. Right. Now, ours may come at a different vantage point, but at the end of the day, we all want clean air. We all want clean water. We all want to maintain natural resources. We all want that. Right. How do we do that at the same time? That's, I think, that, that for me at least, that's the attitude that I try to bring. I think that's a, a very effective uh, way of, of conveying our message. I think that would be something that a lot of people don't really take advantage of because, like you said, um, a lot of debates today or a lot of conversations, any kind of discussion about a controversial topic tend to get very heated very quickly because people don't know how to control that aspect of, of their delivery. And it's understandable, you know, that there's a lot of people that I think in the agriculture industry, I think they feel like they're under attack, you know, or mm. you're at, you're always on the receiving end of negative, negative messages. Yeah. I mean, even our own industry does this to each other. The organic portion of our industry, for example, utilizes their quote, healthier food source right. against traditionally grown, which when you look at that, you're like, man, should we be doing that? Yeah, and it's one thing to state that there is no, no pesticides, no antibiotics, none of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, but not to market that in a way that if you are a traditional grower, that you're somehow bad. I mean, right. we have growers in the San Joaquin Valley who do both. Right. Boswell does both and does a lot of organic, and God knows he does a ton of traditionally grown food products or cotton or whatever he's got in the ground. Right, and it's examples like the one you gave that lead to uh, a topic we'll be talking about in another episode, which is labeling. It causes fear-mongering and, and a misconception about the agriculture industry, and it basically creates a civil war in an industry that we all need, which is agriculture. Correct. So um, just moving on to uh, another one of our questions, uh, how can we ensure the future generations um, will engage in more civil and intellectual conversation as opposed to emotionally charged yelling matches like we were talking about earlier? Oh, man. And that is, I guess that's the greatest question. And I don't know, I don't know that any of us have that answer. I think we're getting a lot of kids staying in agriculture. I don't know that they're necessarily staying in production. Production's tough, at least around here, yeah, as you know. Less than 2% of the population is involved in it. Yeah, I mean, even today in class, we, we had a discussion about some of this kind of stuff. Mm. I think one of the things is what you're doing right here. I think that's, that's one of them. I think the other part of it is having uniquenesses within the FFA that offers kids this opportunity, mm. not just the standard bearers of extemp and prepared in those sorts of things, but I think having the opportunity to study, research, become passionate about something, and then to find your voice in that thing. Mm. And I think every generation has to pass on to the next generation the responsibility to take care of I mean, we talk about being stewards of the land. We need to be stewards of the people who are going to take over the land. Correct. I and agree. I think that's something that not just in, not just in ag education. I think that's in in all walks of life. That to to ensure that we need to 
make sure they understand the responsibility that they have for that next generation. Yeah, that was going to lead to another question I had, which you partially answered it there. Um, in terms of expanding upon agriculture in all different types of discussions, political or uh, educational or you know any kind of discussion that we have in general, not just agricultural, um, do you think that these same methods of, of discussing these topics apply? Oh, absolutely. I, I, it, it's just, for me, it's, it's, it's your lifestyle. Mm. I, it, it absolutely is a lifestyle. And, and it's not one, and <clears throat> I make it sound like I've done this all my life, I haven't. Um, I have gotten argumentative, mm -hmm. I, I'm not gonna lie. You know, we had at Fresno Fair one year, uh, PETA came in before the sale started and they took up the entire sale barn where everybody was supposed to sit, all the buyers were supposed to sit, and they wow. delayed the sale for well over an hour. Wow. And obviously I had, a bunch of kids at the fair that were getting worked up and I, I just got them all together and I, I kept them inside the barn. I said, stay away. You're not going to benefit anything by getting in an argument. Right. And one guy came over and he kind of got in my face a little bit and yes, it turned into an argument mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. In that circumstance, I was a young ag teacher. I've only been teaching, I think, three years and I did not do an effective job and I argued back and they had to get security to get rid of this guy and the whole mm -hmm. thing. But I think the more we read, the more you read on leadership, the more that you immerse yourself, not only in the leadership tactics and the leadership training, but also understanding, in-depth understanding, mm -hmm. research, study of the topics that you could potentially deal with, and there's a variety of them, mm -hmm. the more you recognize, and it's, again, I'm gonna go back to this concept, and it's, it's disengage. And so in the book, Extreme Ownership, which I highly recommend, one of, the, one of the portions of this is dedicated to being able to disconnect yourself. Disengage, disconnect. And it's not disengage in the sense that I'm mentally shutting off. It's disengaging from the proverbial tree that's right in front of you so you don't miss the forest that's out around you. And in the book, they're talking, it was what's called a blue on blue. And that's when friendly forces are firing on friendly forces but they don't know it okay and so before this actually this actually occurred mm -hmm. and they use this a battle scene they apply it to then to business they completely stopped everything they were doing and triple checked and a lieutenant had to ask a colonel on three separate occasions to not fire on a building well come to find out if they would have they would have killed about 20 navy seals wow so the concept now disengage means okay i'm gonna i'm not gonna engage this i'm not gonna get right back into the discussion mm -hmm. what's going on around me so that i can see everything that's going on and i can understand what's going on around me so that i don't get pinholed into one thing i see and it's a it they do a much better job than i just did talking <laughs> about that in a book but it's it's truly is a leadership technique that you can use that applies to that just what we're talking about oh, that's really interesting Okay. Um, you talked about a little bit earlier um, the difference between um, the, two, the two different components in an argument being a, a lack of fact and overcharged emotion. So in a discussion or in a speech or any kind of um, conveyance of a message of any sort, um, of course there's a, a large portion of fact that needs to be used in order to have any kind of credibility. Do you believe there is room for emotion, or what role does emotion play in, in those kinds of uh, discussions? Oh, absolutely. I think emotion shows passion, and emotion shows that you're driven, mm -hmm. that you have a desire. I think those are all things, and that you're competitive. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a competitive nature to it. I think it's the ability to control that to where the emotion is appropriate or congruent for what it is that we are doing or talking mm -hmm. about. Okay. If you're giving a speech, nobody wants to hear somebody that's boring. Right. I agree. There has to be, obviously, in intellect, and there has to be facts, and there has to be data. Mm. But are you presenting it in such a way that it's engaging? I mean, you want to engage your audience. Right. You want to engage the other person. Mm. I mean, looking somebody in the eye, shaking your head, agreeing with them in, a, in places where you can agree, knowing full well that you are mentally and emotionally engaged in conversation, that's emotion. Those mm -hmm. are emotions. They're proper emotions. It's the one we cannot affect, 
or the ones that we should not allow because they're not effective is the negative kinds of things. I see. Those kinds of emotions don't work. And it's not, I didn't say it was easy uh, because it's not, especially if you're very passionate about something. Right. But you have to, again, disengage mm-hmm. so that you can be engaging. All right. That makes sense. I, I think that's a good, um, a good point for our audience to understand uh, along with the other ones that um, a lot of people think that if you bring in large amounts of emotion that people will kind of like be, be draw a lot of attention to yourself and that's sometimes a positive thing I don't think that's the way to, to look at it um, I think that drawing in too much attention to yourself can also be a negative thing because if you don't have a large amount of fact to back yourself up you draw all the attention in, and they see you don't know what you're talking about and you lose all of your all of your footing in, in the discussion yeah um, and credibility absolutely and so I think in that, um, it's important. There, there's always kind of a saying that I always kind of go by whenever I have any kind of discussion with somebody. And that's whenever you have a discussion with somebody, especially about a controversial topic, the first one to get mad loses immediately. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. if you get mad, not only do you just sound like you don't know what you're talking about, you start to lose your cognitive ability to process the things that you, that you want to say. Like even if you have all these facts lined out on a sheet of paper, the second you get mad, you start forgetting your facts and you start forgetting the things that you're going to bring up in the argument and it just starts to make you look like you don't know what you're talking about. Anger also shuts the other person down. Mm. I mean, think about it. If you're having a discussion with somebody and you bring up some things that maybe they don't like, they're mm. factual, right? and they get angry with it, as the other person in the discussion, the wall comes up and you shut down as well. Okay. Because we're, I think most of the time people are trying to avoid conflict. Yeah. Um, and so when that happens, again, for me, as soon as that happens, I completely disengage from that. And I'll go, okay, I'm going to stop this because there's, n- there's nothing positive is going to come out of this thing. And I think that's, we have to pick and choose our battles. Mm-hmm. Um, currently what's going on in the city of Tulare with the mayor of the city of Tulare. The, I think the, the worst thing we could do was to react emotionally to some comments that were not favorable to agriculture whatsoever right would his mind be changed i I don't know i know that the very radical animal rights activists you're not going to change their mind no and so getting into a debate in those circumstances on a street corner wherever it might be at a county fairgrounds you're probably better off walking away from that one because it's probably not the hill that you want to die on because it's not going to be effective. Right. Okay. So um, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, young people learning about um, how to effectively talk about these things because, like you said, with the fair example, you had kids that wanted to go up and talk to the PETA members, and that's that's no um, – there's, there's no effective way of, of doing that. And um, – being in your class, we've talked about effective ways of having these discussions with the public and, and that kind of thing. So do you believe it's more beneficial for, for students, to, like for teachers to teach students, the effective way to talk to somebody about these kinds of topics in, in a classroom setting is basically my question. Yes, and I wish we had a, I wish we had a class that had that type of curriculum built into it. Mm. Uh, I'm I think if you had a class that had that type of curriculum built into it, the clientele that you would have that take the class would be people like you and mm-hmm. Evan, Abby, those kids that want to do that sort of thing. But yeah, there's a structure to this. And the other thing, life should, if you continue to learn in life, life should teach you some of these things. And and some of it is, it's self-taught. I mean, you have to learn it. I, I came across, again, the, the Extreme Ownership book, about eight months ago okay didn't really know what I was getting into but saw it read the review and I thought hmm, that sounds interesting <laughs> and I've now read it four times Wow and there's notes all over the book and I've actually used those and I'm 52 well, I wish I would have had that book when I was 32 yeah it didn't <laughs> but I have it now so I think it doesn't necessarily have to just be in a class I think there's what you kids are learning, what I learned in the FFA, are all the tools, it's all the foundational stuff, and then what you do with it from there is kind of up to you guys. Because you won't get that sort of thing in college. Right. You get it in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that's um, I think that's a very good uh, point you have there. Um, in, in our current society, it seems like there's a lot of debates breaking out. 
whether they be civil or, or more engaging and more com- confrontational, it seems like there's a lot of, um, which maybe it's just the media blowing it up, but there's a lot of um, more uh, controversial, more or less discussions and debates breaking out um, all over the country. Um, do you think in terms of improving ag literacy and fixing these issues regarding agriculture, politics, and society, is is it helpful to, or is it more helpful or harmful to engage in these kinds of, not necessarily debates, but discussions with these people? Well, I think it, it depends on, I think it really depends on the circumstance. Okay. Um, I guess to fully answer that question, it'd be more, what would be an, an example circumstance and I think you have to play that one by ear uh, I agree with you if on a college campus for example if you don't agree with a particular point of view on these college campuses uh, you're shouted down mm-hmm. there is no freedom of speech really on a college campus if that it flies in the face of something that the mass group doesn't believe in right and at that point I don't know what you do there. Mm. I, I'm not sure that there's an effectiveness. Without paying the price, Ben Shapiro <laughs> pays the price, but and he's okay with it. Yeah, he's okay with that. But I think your personality style kind of has to fit there as well. Okay. Um, I think just to kind of add on to that, um, I'm not sure if I'm addressing this in kind of a question stance, but in addressing that topic, do you think that we have a certain responsibility to uh, inform the public about agricultural topics, even if they're being aggressive in how they respond to those topics? Like, like let, just to give you an example, like let's say, um, like with the example you gave on a college campus, that there's a group of individuals um, that are not not to say rioting, but like in it, like protesting the idea of genetic modification. Mm-hmm. If if I were on that college campus and I had something to say about that topic, if I had um, knowledge that I could provide on that subject, would it be more beneficial, like, would it be beneficial to agriculture for me to go up and say that, or do I have that responsibility because I have that knowledge to go up and say my part in, in that debate, do you think? Let's look at this from the standpoint of how effective would you be able to be? So if you're looking at that, they already have this hard and fast agenda. Right. They probably don't know their side very well. Mm. Some, some may. But in terms of looking at the other side, they have already made a decision It's bad. Mm. I think we're better off doing what you're doing right here. I think you're better off being involved in proactive marketing, proactive discussions than in trying to engage somebody that's, I agree with you, not necessarily right, but if they're doing a major protest because they're just going to shout you down. Okay. And you, they have numbers on their side. Yeah. I mean, literally, they have numbers on their side. Mm-hmm. But I don't think we should shy away from the opportunities that we do get provided right. through a variety of different means to be able to talk about these issues. Okay. And uh, that kind of leads into the um, the next question I had, which you basically answered it there. I'm not sure if you have any more to say on it, but um, obviously we have some people, like you said, the animal rights activists and some of the more um, activist types of groups, and maybe they don't know what they're talking about, but it's very likely they're not going to back down from their side. They're not going to budge to what we're trying to tell them. What do we do about these individuals in terms of trying to, we're trying to promote ag literacy, we're trying to get more people on our side, and we have these people that are never going to budge, and we're trying to make sure that the people who are in the middle don't go to their side. So what do we do about those who who cannot be convinced? I don't know that you're going to change them. I think you don't worry about them. Mm. But I think you worry about the people that, you, as you said, in the middle or the people that don't really have an opinion one way or another. Mm-hmm. I think that's where we have to try to get those folks. Okay. And if we can change their heart, we can change their mind. Just and we have to have, we have to have people that are willing not just physically willing, but willing to do the hard intellectual lifting of knowing their subject really well. Mm. And then being able to have a, a legitimate, rational, logical conversation based on facts. 
do you think that we'll be able to reach that middle fast enough before the more emotional opponents to our side does though it's all about numbers mm. right mm -hmm. it's about numbers absolutely and the more numbers that we get the better off we are yeah and I, I think having former FFA members that are now in our federal government I think that helps mm -hmm. and to get a voice and to again do what you're doing mm -hmm. do the same thing on a college campus those are all things that it begins to spread and positive marketing works it works we all like it mm -hmm. and I think that's I don't know that we can worry about numbers we just have to do our job and let the let we have the benefit is we have facts on our side mm -hmm. we do and so with facts on our side we just need to put those things out there in a way and in a forum that is engaging enlightening and is interesting so you said earlier that you listened to Jordan Peterson, and we were just talking about this the other day, but I started listening to him as well. And one of the things that he said is that, um, which this is also in the book that I was talking, talking to you about, A Moral Case for, more, for uh, Capitalism. Um, one of the things that I saw was that people more accurately or more effectively respond to emotion before they respond to fact. Do you believe that's true? And in that case, us having facts on the side, on our side, what does that really mean if we can't reach that crowd faster than you know for example the animal rights activists oh i think i do think that people are initially the emotional side of of a, a topic or a debate mm -hmm. but again i think you diffuse the emotion by our own personality mm -hmm. or using the right kinds of personality traits those interpersonal skills we we're talking about and then engaging them with fact okay and i think can it can't all be emotion you know we have some of that of course but we i think you better put a lot of fact in there as well <laughs> right I, I i agree with that so um right before we uh, ended off here i have one more question for you kind of just you know off the top of my head just came up with it um do you think with because there's a lot of opposition to our side as as you said the the rights activists the non-gmo um, I guess you could say activists, the organic farmers that believe that our side is harmful or dangerous. Um, and for the ones that don't know what they're talking about, they have a pretty large voice in the media right now. We're kind of just getting started in terms of media because the average age of the American farmer is 58 years old and we have you know less than 2% of the population involved in production ag. We have a lot of, we have a lot of support on our side, but they're having a hard time getting their voice out on the media. Do you think we can get our voice out there to catch up to our ever-growing population that we're going to need on our side over the next 30 years? Oh, I do. I absolutely do. You think we can catch up? Yes, I, I absolutely think. Well, yes, I do. Will it be work? Of course it will be. Mm -hmm. I think it's the next generation. It's your guys' generation that's going to have to do that and be creative in the process by which you do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that the, I think you said opposition. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. You, I don't know that their numbers are as great as you might think. I think there's a lot of people in the heartland of this of this nation that do not agree with that. Mm. I think when you get on the the coasts and you get into larger cities, you see you see a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. That's where our news media outlets are located, right. and so those are something maybe that's more logical. But I think as you fly over this country, there's a lot of rural parts of this country. There's a lot of really good, solid people that, again, as I go back to one of the things we said in the beginning. These are intelligent people. Yes, they are. Just because they might have uh, grease stains on a pair of pants does not imply that they're not intelligent, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so I think they see through this a lot. But it's going to be your guys' responsibility to – the messaging is going to be critically important mm -hmm. as we move forward. I agree with you on there. All right, well, um, that's all I have for questions just to kind of wrap up here. Do you have any – final comments you want to make on in terms of the importance of ag literacy or what we're doing here or what the attitude of you know having our knowledge that we have and, and how we can spread that do you have any more uh, comments on, on that topic yeah just don't stop learning hmm. do not stop learning do not stop doing the research make yourself ready I mean have yourself trained and ready should the opportunity arise hmm. look for those opportunities mm -hmm. And when you have those opportunities, you need to reflect on, okay, what did I do well? 
what do I need to improve on moving forward? And I think it's it's one of those things that you can role play this and practice this. But I think that, again, the biggest thing is find an opportunity. But when you have it, you need to have yourself ready when that opportunity arises. I think that's a very good uh, advice to, to give to our audience here. So that was kind of the last of the um, the interview points I wanted to, to touch on here. And uh, you guys heard a lot of the things he was saying. There, there are things that we brought up in previous episodes and that we're going to continue to bring up in, in further episodes. There's a few things I even uh, hadn't thought about b- before, so I'm glad that you kind of enlightened me on, on some of those topics. So, um, yeah, if, if you don't have anything else you want to say to our audience here, I think we're going to wrap up here. So, uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Kwan here for, for joining me. Yeah. And, My um, pleasure. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah, make sure you guys tune in next Wednesday for we're going to have another interview, actually, and this time I'll actually tell you guys, I got a hold of the founder of the group, My Job Depends on Ag, uh, Eric Wilson, and he agreed to be on our next episode. So make sure you guys tune in. That's going to be an exciting one. So yeah, we'll see you guys later. And don't forget, if you ate today, thank a farmer.